tradition, these things were handed down. And the reason they're the same is because the source was the same. If you go back to the science of, this is a PhD thesis for somebody. If you go back to the, all of the uh, transmitters of the Quran, they go back to the same people. All of them, without exception. Only a handful of people transmitted the Quran. They all go back to the same ones. And so this is one of the miracles of Islam is the tradition that's handed down, unbroken chains, Quran, Hadith, Fiqh, and then the tools, the Adawat, even though they're different schools and they debate about things. You had the Kufan and the Basran schools in, in language. These are different schools and they, and they will debate about uh, certain things. So all of this is part of the gifts of Islam. Now in this country, this is a country where tradition has been maintained. It's, this, it's, it's broken down in many places. People are very confused. But if you come to Turkey, there's much less confusion about what religion is. And the reason for that is that they protected th this tradition. Their ulama did not allow these alien forces to come in and divide and conquer them. Because Allah says, وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا We forget that it's a prohibition to become sectarian in the Quran. It's a prohibition. There's nahi عَنَ التَّفَرُّقْ Allah says, وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا How did the Muslims do that? They had no synods. They had no magisterium. They had no councils. How did they do that? If you look at, uh, if you look at the Jews, the Jews have certain rabbinical councils that meet together and decide what's orthodoxy and what's not. If you look at the Christians, they had councils. They had the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Chaldea. They had the Council of Alexandria. They had all these different councils. They come together and they meet and their bishops discuss what's going to be doctrine and they hash it out. And then they come to certain agreements and some of them disagree, they become heretics or heterodoxic. Right? And that's how the religion... The Muslims had none of that. There's no councils. There's no synods. There's no magisterium. How did they come to these agreements? This is a miracle of Islam. The providential hand that is taking care of this religion is so evident to anybody that's willing to openly look at it. How did they agree that there were... Uh, the Sunni community agree there are four basic madhab. How did they agree to that? Despite the fact we had dozens of madhabs. What happened to Laith? Really, where's Sufyan al -Thawri? These were great fuqaha, but their ways died out. Where's Imam al-Zai? Where's Abu Dawud al-Zahiri? Why Malik, Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, and, uh, and Ahmad? Why these four? The Inayah ilahiyya. These are the people that Allah, and it's not that the others were less than them, but for whatever hikmah, Allah chose these four to be the canonical schools of the Sunni tradition and the Ja'fari in the, in the Shia tradition. Th this is a miracle of Islam, to do this and to have them accept each other. The fact that they had four mihrab in the Kaaba is a miracle of Islam, that they weren't fighting each other. And, and if, the, if the Maliki was late for his Dhuhr uh, prayer, he would, uh, if, I'm sorry, if the Shafi'i was late for the Dhuhr prayer, he would pray with the Malikis. If the Shafi'i, the Hanafi, and the Hanbali were late for their uh, Asr prayer, they would pray with the Hanafis. If they were late for their Fajr prayer, they would pray with the Hanafis. And this, this wasn't because they were sectarian, they had one mihrab in Medina. People say, oh look, they got to a point, there was so much sectarianism, they had four madhab. No, it's pre-microphone. You know, Kaaba is a big place. They didn't, there, there, there was space for everybody. And that was the Sa'at al-Sudur. They had big breasts and they let everybody uh, pray there. Each madhab was honored. The Hanafi obviously got the biggest one because the majority were Hanafi. And the Shafi'i at one point also very big. The Maliki small and then the Hanbali was very small because there were very few Hanbalis. But each was honored. And then in the Aqidah, you look at the Aqidah schools that were transmitted. The, the lots of debates. How did they agree on these things? Undeniably, there were periods of fitnah and, and we went through uh, similar problems that other religions have had. But how did they arrive to these agreed upon things? This is not to deny that there are people, dissenters. There, there are. And they, if, they were, if they were of a caliber 
that the other ulama recognized their right to dissent, they would acknowledge it. But if they were heretics, they would call it what it was. Right? Haraseya is a Greek word, zandaka is used in Arabic, but haraseya in Greek means to choose for yourself. A heresy is where you pick and choose your religion. You don't accept what's transmitted, what's agreed upon. And so, and so in the aqidah, this, this is what they came. They, they came to, to, to the, the, the Ash'ari, the Maturidi. This, uh, the Ottoman Dola was Maturidi. The Muhammad al-Fatih, he came into this city and conquered this city. The Prophet praised him. He said, Ni'm al-Amir. He said, Ni'm al-Jaysh wa Ni'm al-Amir. Ni'm al-Amiru amiruhum wa Ni'm al-Jaysh jayshuhum. What a blessed Amir is their Amir and what a blessed army is their army. He was, by consensus, Hanafi, Maturidi, and Naqshbandi. So the Prophet was praising a Hanafi, Maturidi, Naqshbandi. And people say, Bid'ah, Mubtada'ah. Astaghfirullah, would the Prophet praise a Mubtada'ah? He would never praise a Mubtada'ah. And yet we know he praised the conqueror of this city. He said, Ni'm al-Amir. Ni'mah is the way the Arabs say, the best, that's the best Amir, their Amir. And he would never praise worldly things, not like uh, he was a great general, which he was. No, he was praising his Iman. He was praising his Aqidah. He was praising his practice because he was Imamun Adil and Sab'atun Yadhinuhum Allah Yawma La Dhinna Illa Dhinnuhum. Seven are, are given the shade of Allah on the day of judgment when there's no shade except Allah's shade. The first, the first, Imamun Adil, a just ruler. That's how high their maqam is. A high ruler. The dhikr of the, the umara is Adil. That's their dhikr. To practice justice. They don't have to do a lot of subha even though he did. Or do a lot of tilawa even though he did. Qiyam They don't have to do any of that. If they're just, that's their dhikr. And they reach these high maqams. So that was who he praised. So this transmission, and then the, the third area, this is Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. How did they agree on the way of Imam al-Junaid? Imam al-Junaid is Imam by consensus. Imam al-Ta'ifatayn. No Sunni can yata'anu fi... Dr. Omar, you're here. He's a much greater scholar than I am. You know, I'm astaghfirullah, not even put my name under scholarship, but student of knowledge. But Dr. Omar, Imam al-Junaid, anybody disagree on him from the Sunni tradition? Do you know? Nobody. Ibn Taymiyyah praises him, everybody praises him. He's Imam al-Ta'ifatayn. He was a great scholar in, in, the, in, 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 in his madhab of Thawri, he was a great scholar. And he was a great uh, Sufi. And his tasawwuf spread because one of his students was the single most important narrator of Abu Dawood's uh, Musnad. So when, when Abu Dawood, the Sunan of Abu Dawood, when he went to Mecca and began transmitting the Hadith, he taught Imam Junaid's uh, teaching there and it spread all over the world. So in Morocco, the little children, they learned fi aqtara sha'ari wa fi qimarik wa fi tariqat al-Junaid al-Sadiq. And that's what they all learned. The, the aqid of Imam al-Ash'ari, the fiqh of Imam Malik, and the, the way of Imam al-Junaid. And this was Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. And people say, you know, wh wh where is that? Where's tasawwuf in Islam? Where's the, the word? The, it's a technical term. It's a technical term. Just like mantiq, kalam, fiqh. Fiqh is a technical term. People forget that. All the hadith in which the Prophet uses fiqh, he did not mean jurisprudence. He meant understanding. مَنْ يُرِيدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرٍ يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ He gives them an understanding of the religion. They use it later and the books of fiqh always begin with that hadith because it's تَفَاؤُلًا تَبَرُّكًا But the original meaning of that, you look in the commentaries of a hadith, it meant يُفَهِّمُهُ فِي الدِّينِ And the Sahaba knew that رُبَّ حَامِرِي فِقْهٍ لَيْسَ بِفَقِي Sometimes somebody who walks around with a lot of information in his head isn't a faqi. They have all the outward, uh, what Imam Marqazari calls al-mutarassimun, the formalists. And he speaks very ill of them in the Ihya. Al-mutarassimun are the people of Rusum. They're trapped in the outward letter of the law and they don't know the spirit of the law. 
the, in Western, if you're studying Western tradition, what they call deontological ethics as opposed to teleological. In other words, a command theory type of ethics where everything's just rules, statute law, without understanding the, the, the teleological nature of, of law. What's the purpose? Why, why do we have these rules? Why, why were we given these things? Allah has reasons for everything. He gave us intellect. He made us rational creatures. We're not irrational creatures, even though we behave irrationally and we have an irrational component to us. But our nature is rational. Language is rational. Syntax is rational. The reason you can sit here and listen to me for however long you listen to me is because my words are put together in a way that has meaning. If it didn't, then you couldn't. If I was just table, sky, letter, I don't know. You know, if, it, if you just start talking like that, you walk out and say he's gone mad, right? because it would be irrational. So we are rational creatures and that's why Allah has spoken to us in, in a way that speaks to our intellects. فَاعْتَبِرُوا يَا أُولِي الْأَبَصَارِ Think, people of discernment, people of inner eye, people of understanding. فَاعْتَبِرُوا اِعْتِبَارِ It's a beautiful word. In Arabic it's related to the word Arabiya. You know, the abara. Ma'bara is a bridge. الدنيا معبرة فتعبروها ولا تعمروها is one of the sayings of Isa the, this world is a bridge so cross over تعبروها ولا تعمروها don't build on it don't think it's a permanent abode cross over it the, the ibra is the lesson but it comes from عبور which is language takes you from one place to another that's why all language is according to Ibn Jinni and other great Arab scholars the linguist said that language is metaphorical by nature because we're speaking, to, we're using symbols, signs to signify something in order for me to take your mind from one place to another. So this is what i'tibar is. It's the ability to look at one thing and, and, and understand something else by it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he tells you that they destroy their houses with their own hands and with the hands of the believers Allah is saying think about this isn't it amazing that Allah can take a people and he will make them destroy their own houses with their own hands the houses that they cherish that they built with those hands and yet he will cause them to destroy their own houses as a punishment to them. So Allah is saying, reflect on this. See the qudra of Allah. See the qudra of Allah in this. Because nobody would destroy his house. It's a mad thing to do. But people do it because Allah is punishing them. And so this is what Allah is saying. See the ibra, the lesson in it. And when the ibra is, is really penetrated, when it's really understood, you get the abra, which is tears. That's where the, the abra come from. Because it's, that's where meaning when meaning penetrates the heart, the eyes often well up because it, they're overwhelmed. The, it, it fills the heart and so that you can be filled with pain. You so much pain that you begin to overflow. And that's what tears are. They're the overflowing of the heart with something. You can have tears of joy and that's when the heart is filled with joy so it overflows you can have meaning so powerful that you're so overwhelmed by it that you start to overflow that's what tears are they're overflowing inside your souls of meaning negative positive spiritual material but meaning so this is a great gift that we have you know this tradition that we have and there's people that want to reduce us on to two-dimensional islam they want to reduce it, or one dimensional. They want to make it Islam without Iman and Ihsan. Or they want to make it Iman without Islam and Ihsan. Or they want to make it Ihsan without Iman and Islam. Or they want to make it Ihsan and, and Iman without Islam. You can't. It's a holistic, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a three legged stool. You have to have all three for it to, to stand. Right? You cannot have one without the other. And this is why if Islam becomes divested of, of its spirituality, it becomes a shell. You have to have ihsan. And you have to have iman. 
And you can't have ihsan without iman and Islam really in reality. But there are people that will want to try to make it that. Islam spiritual, Islam's here, brother. It's in the heart. No, iman is in the heart. Islam is out, it's an outward thing, sharia. It's, it's doing outward thing. Anybody can be a munafiq, can be a Muslim, but he can't be a mu'min. Because mu'min is an interior reality that reflects on the exterior. And then ihsan is the depth dimension. It's, it's what gives you, the iman gives you the height. Islam gives you the breadth, but ihsan gives you the depth. And that's why what you witness here is ihsan. Because these were people of ihsan. I mean, these were great people of ihsan. And so it, it's, you know, I just, t to a few uh, statements in conclusion, what one of the things, all of us are on a journey. 